Hello, I'm PJ Kwong for SDS LinkedIn Live. Don't you want to know more about your new normal where you live and work? I know I do. And today we're going to be joined by two experts who are going to help us figure this out. Um, I know already that there are tons of people watching. And for me, I'm in sunny Toronto, Canada. And given the global nature of this talk, I'm going to be joined by two experts who are elsewhere in the world, starting with Dr. Simon Harkis, lab manager and tech expert, connectivity and products for SGS UK. Welcome, Simon. Hey, thanks for having me. Is it sunny there? It actually is. It was uh, raining cats and dogs, the proverbial cats and dogs this morning, which would have been lovely British typical weather, but <laughs> it's tricked us today and you brought the sunshine. So <laughs> Wonderful. That's what I like to hear. Okay, let's see if we can go three for three on the sunshine, because we're pleased to welcome Tim Quinn, Senior Product Manager, Cloud Monitor Monitoring for SGS North America. Thanks for joining us, Tim, from sunny South Carolina, South Southern California, rather. Yes. Thank you for having me. Yes, yeah, Southern California, where it's sunny here every day. And that is the best news. So three for three on the sunshine and three for three on this fantastic talk we're going to have about our new normal where we live and work. So a bit of background, some broad strokes to start with. The importance of our environment cannot be underscored enough and being able to monitor what's going on is vital. So I'm going to start with you, Simon, and the air we breathe. Given the latest news from the World Health Organization regarding air quality requirements, can you explain how these are defined? Uh, yeah, sure. Very good place to start. Um, and as you've mentioned, the World Health Organization, let's go with the way that they do it. So they they define air quality in terms of uh, particulate matter, uh, usually uh, denoted as PM, and then they give a number. So PM1, okay. PM2.5, PM10 is typical. And those numbers are, are the size of the, of the solid matter that they're talking about in microns. Now, to give you an idea what that means, um, typically a, a human hair is around about 100 microns or so, depending on where in the world you're from and what color your hair is. But th that gives you an idea, right? So PM10 is like 10% of that size and PM1 is one one hundredth of, of that size. So these things are tiny particles we're talking about. And who wants those floating around in the air? You can't see them. Um, the reason that we're so concerned about them is because they're a, a respirable size, right? So they're the ideal size to enter your lungs and, and the smaller ones in particular can go quite deep inside your lungs and cause things like um, asthma attacks and, and other respiratory problems. So these are... These are particles we should be concerned about, and and we are. And uh, the World Health Organization uh, have just updated their guidelines, as you say, to to reduce the the recommended levels in the air that we breathe. And who doesn't want to breathe clean air, right? Our families <laughs> breathe it, we breathe it. So everybody. Everybody should be concerned about this, absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting because this is obviously a topic of great interest uh, to our audience. It resonates with everybody. And looking at the comments, I've already seen people from Senegal, from Turkey, from South America, from Pakistan, I mean, India. This is fantastic to have a global audience on this global topic is wonderful. And hi to Angola as well. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Hola to our friends in Mexico and from Rome. Oh, I'd like to get back to Rome. Anyway, um, so let's move on a little bit. And um, Tim, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in. We're talking about air quality. And I've heard of this next thing, but um, I'd love for you to explain it to me. What exactly is cloud remote sensor air monitoring? Yeah, so... What we've um, developed, and I think it's now starting to propagate throughout the industrial hygiene world, um, are remote sensors that are hooked up to some sort of communications path, let's say either cellular, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, some way for a device to communicate through the internet that would allow the user to be able to view the data, download the data, or even manipulate the device itself from a remote location. And this is what's the power of the cloud. The cloud is bi-directional, one way, and it's also the other way. As opposed to putting out a sensor somewhere or having to monitor a site manually, we have the ability now to, to monitor sites remotely. You know what? You guys have just uh, made me think of something. Um, before we go any further, I just know that there's a question on everybody's mind, and that is about the detection of the COVID-19 virus. So from your standpoint, talking about filtration, Simon, what's the deal? And then I'm going to move on to you, Tim, to ask the same question about monitoring for the COVID virus. Simon? 
Sure, that's a, it's a very topical question. <laughs> so um, yeah. we don't, um, when in terms of testing for filtration for, for things like viruses, we don't, we don't detect them uh, directly. But what I can say, and, and it goes back to the answer to my previous question is, so let, let's talk about coronavirus specifically, right? It's okay. typically around about uh, 100 nanometers in size, which is, which we, if we're using the same notation we were using earlier, would be PM 0 0.1. So it's below the value that, that the World Health Organization is looking at because it's a very small, a small virus, right? But we, uh, as a lab, we can detect down to those particle sizes. The tricky part is is um, speciating exactly for for a virus. You know, it's it's not quite a solid matter. It's not quite a liquid. It's not quite an oil. It's a mixture of all of these things. So we're capable of, of detecting particles of that size. And we're able to we're able to um, test air purify purification systems and filters to see if they will remove particulate matter around the same size but we don't species it specifically for coronavirus. But what we can say, right, is, hey, if your air purifier or your filtration system doesn't remove down to, to 0.1 micron, it's probably not, not going to remove coronavirus. Okay, super interesting. What about you, Tim? What can you add to this? Well, you know, from an indoor air quality standpoint, um, what we've been studying and what we've been reading with regards to um, remote sensor air monitoring for indoor air quality is when you find a, uh, an increased levels of four things, CO2, particulate matter, relative humidity, and ozone, those are direct correlations for the likelihood of having an increased chance of having some sort of virus and including coronavirus um, present in your particular space. If your CO2 levels are high, you're not getting a good filter infiltration or filtration of the air or movement of air. Same thing with particulate matter. Relative humidity needs to be somewhere between 40 and 60% optimally. Uh, and then ozone itself. These are indicators and in direct correlation to the likelihood of increased levels or chances of having some sort of virus present. So monitoring these things um, will, again, hopefully, uh, and corrective action of these things will hopefully reduce those chances. You know, this is just fascinating. So monitoring is one thing, but Simon, there are other things that I think we should be talking about. For instance, what is the purpose of filtration testing? I, from our point of view, it's it's validation, right? This is this is the key thing and, and the key message really that, that I want to try and get across to, to the audiences. Um, let's say, for example, Tim finds a problem, he, you know, he, he takes his monitors to a building or a room and he finds that it, within that room, within that environment, for whatever reason, there's a, a bunch of pollen because it's near a rose garden or it's next to a road. So there's a whole bunch of particulate matter. The solution typically is filtration, right? So you go to a manufacturer or you are a system builder and you install some sort of filtration. But how do you know that works? How do you know for sure that, that the filtration system is doing what it's supposed to do? And our laboratories, are, that's what we're here for. We, we validate that these filters are, are fit for purpose, but also do what they're supposed to do. You know, it's interesting to me. It seems as if you guys are like the, the hand and the glove, that you're both sides of the same coin in, in many ways. So, Tim, um, you've been talking specifically about monitors and monitoring. So a double-ended question for you. Where can you use these monitors and how are the monitors calibrated? Right. Um, so the SmartSense technology, it's called within the SGS in our New York uh, laboratory, um, they're comprised, as if you can see there, um, small boxes, not very big, very light, um, and allows you to throw those um, devices anywhere you want. We have uh, weather resistant boxes for outdoor um, applications, like let's say construction site monitoring, perimeter monitoring for, um, for particles if they're moving dirt, indoor air quality for VOCs, anything to that sort. We've done, we've done some real interesting jobs. Uh, one in particular, real quickly, was at a hospital, a brand new hospital in California that opened up, and immediately the top two floors of the hospital received nuisance odor complaints right from day one. Um, consulting with my CIH at that facility, uh, we placed a smart sense monitor on the roof and the top two floors, and immediately started to receive alerts. The beauty of our technology is not only is the box being able to monitor real time, but the box can also tell you when you have a problem or when a threshold has been exceeded and will send you an alert via text or email. So in this case, we immediately started taking those text alerts and walked over to the helicopter folks that do the emergency takeoff and landings and noticed right away every time we had an alert, there was a helicopter taking off and landing. 
So we were able to rectify the situation just by that data. You, no, oh, sorry. On, I'm sorry. With regards to calibration, calibration is really, it's, it's all done right out of the factory. It comes to the site. But the great thing about cloud technology, again, it's bi-directional. It's one way and it's the other way. So if there is a, a need to make any sort of calibration adjustments, we can do these on the fly via the cloud. We have the ability to do that virtually. You know, it's so interesting when we're talking about all this, because, of course, we had a little bit of a conversation before the cameras were rolling, and you've used the term already in our recording here, and that is industrial hygiene. So where is that in today's picture? You're a bit of a detective, I know that, but can you please explain that for our audience? Well, industrial hygiene is just the one segment of environmental health and safety that normally relates to air, and air monitoring and air quality. Again, the, the cloud-based remote sensor technology that we use or we do and provide um, does just that. It, anything from CO, CO2, NO2, SO2, particulates, ozone, VOCs, uh, methane, formaldehyde. Uh, we go down the line. We're really just limited to the te sensor technology that's available out there. Normally from about three different manufacturers worldwide make these sensors. Everybody buys their own sensors for their products from the same folks. We're limited to their technology. Our technology is a systems integration task where we plug these into our cloud platform. You know, Simon, I'm going to move over to you for a second because it seems to me as if Tim's detective work is uh, integral in what it is that you're trying to do. Can you explain how those two things work? Sure, absolutely. So, so Tim will go out to a site that's it's typically a building or, or a room or a, or a large factory and he'll monitor the air quality there. And what we do is on a on a smaller scale, but it but it leads directly into that, right? So we we have, we typically test things like a let's say a, a HEPA filter, a high high efficiency particulate um, air filter, and we will test that in an enclosed system. So we 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 know under certain conditions, under specific flows, um, exactly how that filter performs in terms of how well it removes what it's supposed to remove. But what a what typically gets forgotten by those outside of the industry is what's important is, as well is to to make sure that there's enough airflow or, or flow of whatever media you're trying to filter through through the filter so everyone can stop all all of the contaminants coming through a space right you put a brick wall in the way no problem no particles come through but also no air comes through so it's getting a balance between those two things so we test typically like i say uh, the filters within an enclosed system but we also have rooms where we we control the environment and we inject a known amount of a contaminant and we test things like air purifiers in those rooms and so we were able to test um how well filtration systems work how well filters work to ensure that and validate that they're fit for purpose to use in the places that tim monitors right right so when we've got a problem he knows that the the solution does what it's supposed to do and I think it's it's also important to, to mention it at this point, which is a little slightly off topic, but but the same topic. Um, our labs also test for water. We also test for oil filtration. We also test fuel filtration. The principles are, uh, are very similar, right? You've got a, a media that you're trying to purify and you need a filter to remove the impurities from that system. And across the, the labs at SGS, we're, we're capable of doing all of those things. You know, I have another bit of a question and that is to do with that helicopter example that Tim gave us. So let's just say that you were brought into the project. Um, can can you tell me how his detective work would be helpful to you and uh, would that determine the kind of air purifier that you would use in that helicopter scenario? I'm talking to you, Simon. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So so the, the key parameters for, for a filter really are not only how it performs, but the situation in, in which it's meant to perform. So you, you could, um, depending on the environment, you really need to, to specify a certain type of filter. So for example, um, uh, Tim was talking about volatile organics earlier and, and certain gaseous molecules and things. You need a completely different type of filter to remove molecular gases than you do to remove particulates so you, you really do need to to specify the environment and the application for your filter before you can decide what filter should be used in you know i've got another analogy and i'm going to get tim to comment on it uh as far as your your two roles and and your two areas of expertise somebody said to me it's like weather versus climate change so tim can you comment on whether you're the weather or whether you're the climate change <laughs> Well, I think it's a little bit of both, honestly, because, um, you know, 
weather would be on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, yeah. that's, that's what we do. We solve problems. This technology can solve problems. Uh, the values in the data with this type of uh, technology, right? When you, instead of being there for one or two hours uh, with some sort of filter or sucking air or have a handheld device, we're collecting data points once a minute. So we're providing you not only uh, real-time data at the spot, but then after a few weeks or a month or two, um, now we're going to have some sort of trends and data trending and we'll data mining. And, and again, the value is in the data because when you're having, we have that many data point readings, now you can make actionable decisions off of that since you have so much data. So I would say we're a little bit of both. Okay, that's great. Okay, everybody, if you're a fan of clean air like I am, feel free to put in team clean air in the chat. We're talking about air filtration and monitoring in the new normal where we live and work with our experts, Dr. Simon Harkis and Tim Quinn. Okay, I wanna remind everybody that we're gonna have a brief Q&A um, at the end of this uh, interview. And if you wanna put in a question, feel free to do so in the chat below the screen. But until then, Simon, this one's for you. Let's look specifically at what type of room air purifiers work the best. That is an interesting question. And um, as with most things in life, there's a balance to be struck. Um, yeah. the, in, in my experience, you know, I've, I've tested huge air, air purifiers that have a, a lot of throughput of air with, um, but they have slightly lower efficiency air filters, but because they're passing the air through the purifiers so many times per minute, let's say, they actually work very well. And on the flip, the flip side of that coin is, um, you know, smaller air purifiers that have less, they have less airflow, but they have a much higher um, uh, specification of filter. So they don't need to pass through as many times to, to remove the particulate uh, or whatever, whatever impurities they're trying to remove, right? And there's a balance to, to be had between those two things and, and all kinds of machines really have their place, right? Then it depends on the size of the area that you're trying to purify. You know, you may well just have a little a little office at home that you, 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 you've you got a, an allergy to pollen and you just want to make sure that after you've cut the grass, you're not going to be sneezing all afternoon. So you may just have a small one with, with a small a small throughput. Uh, these things are typically um, defined by what they call a, a clean air delivery rate. You may hear this in the industry, CADR or CADR, someone will call it. Some people may call it. And that just defines the amount of clean air that can be delivered by the unit at a given time. And it's typically a volume per time measurement. So you can, you can decide based on the size of the area you want to clean, what sort of size of machine you want to use. So people need to do their due diligence. And Absolutely. Need to start and, do a bit of research, that's for yeah. sure. And if you, they've been tested in our lab, they'll typically have something on the box that tells you what that CADR value is. So as always, take a look and figure out what uh, what will work for you and your situation. So Absolutely. Um, Make sure it's been validated. <laughs> yeah, that is the, that is the for sure. That's great advice. Um, great information. And it's clear that filtration and monitoring work in harmony. But I'm thinking that monitoring is about achieving that perfect balance. So, Tim, I'm going to ask you for um, some specific information about sensors. I mean, you mentioned ozone before. Do you have to know what you're looking for in order to apply the specific sensor? Or do you just sort of start with a wide net and then go a little bit further down? Yeah, so for my um, consultant friends out there, um, normally what I do is I get a phone call with a problem and we consult with the, you know, with the situation because every situation is different, right? And it's pretty quickly we're able to narrow down uh, what sensors we want to input into the device itself. Uh, we have the ability to have six uh, separate sensors in each box, but we actually can add more if needed, but we don't really seem to have to go past six sensors themselves. Um, for instance, we've done a, a recent job here in California where there's lots of wildfires. Uh, we have a very large client that has uh, multiple uh, large warehouse buildings throughout the western region of the United States. And they have placed a SmartSense unit just inside and just outside of their facilities that allows them to monitor for PM 2.5. The reason why they have done this is because in the past they've had workers come to them saying, I smell smoke, I don't feel safe. They had no uh, ability at that point to provide any data to the worker to make them feel any better, A, not allow them to walk out, B, or conversely, if it was over an actionable level, then the, the reason or the need to provide them PPE. Um, so this, there's lots of different ways we can look at this, but the technology itself is, is very uh, 
very fluid, very lateral. We can we can massage it to almost any situation. You know, um, I want to remind everybody, as the ticker is saying, that we will have time for a brief Q&A at the end of this interview, just a couple more questions. So make sure that you leave your questions and comments there. And you know what, guys? I think that we could talk about this topic forever. And maybe we should, because let's face it, air quality is right up there, right? Um, Simon, let's get the SGS perspective on all of this. What are SGS's filtration capabilities and where are the locations where these services can be offered? Sure. So as you can imagine, we have quite a, a wide ranging um, set of capabilities uh, globally with the with SGS. Uh, let's go into some specifics. So we, we test for HEPA, you know, high efficiency particulate adsorbent filters. That's what that stands for. I said that. I never clear. knew that. High efficiency particulate absorbing, that is, and ULPA, which is ultra low particulate air filters. So these are these are really the the, the things that go into um they go into air purifiers, for example, or they go into building filtration systems, or they are they are used in cabin air for filtering the air that comes into into your car or into an airplane. Uh, they're also used in things like on the on the back of vacuum cleaners. So you have a bagless vacuum cleaner and it's collecting all the dust. You don't want it coming back out the back end. So they put a, a HEPA filter on typically. But we also test things like um, PPE, for example. Face masks has been quite a popular one recently um, across the labs. Uh, we also test um, fuel, oil and water filtration, as, as I mentioned. And um, yeah, so in terms of global uh, locations, we have my lab in Milton Keynes, which is uh, as the crow flies about an hour north of London. We also have our lab in Grass Lake in Michigan, which uh, has all of the filtration capabilities, including the liquid fuel and oil capabilities. And we have a relatively new lab in Suzhou in China, which has um, uh, which is expanding continuously in, in the air filtration arena. So yeah, we serve uh, we serve the whole global market from from key hubs in in Europe, in the US, and in China, with a whole range of capabilities. If you've got a filtration question or a, a test you want doing, just get in touch. We can pretty much cover everything. And we just want to remind the audience that if you put in comments below our window here in the chat, that a member of our team will be able to be in touch with you. So Tim, you just heard Tim talk about specifics, and now. Guess what? It's your turn. Let's talk specifics about cloud remote sensor monitoring services from SGS. Why should I try them? And what is the cost? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, the two key things for our consultant friends out there are, are essentially this is a technician in the field. So why only can you be billing for the smart sense technology monitoring in the field? That same person can be over at another job billing for a second time in the same time uh, in the same day. Um, you know, but the other thing too, though, what I like more is the power. It eliminates the need to having to be there at the right time. Every consultant out there in the world has had a call saying, I smell it. There it is. It's back. And by the time you get there, you can't smell it. They can't smell it. You don't know where it's been or where it went. Um, so those two things are very key. The smart sense cloud technology is always going to be there for you. It's a tech in the field. And um, it allows you to uh, to do many, many things, including uh, increase your revenue as a consultant partner. Now, for non-consultants out there in businesses, this is a relatively inexpensive piece of technology. I'd like to correlate it to, let's say, a large business wants to do some monitoring. Uh, the cost is roughly about the same as a you to hire a consultant to come in for about one or two days worth of work. Um, wow. This is about the same for a whole month's mon continuous monitoring, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So relatively inexpensive technology. I know you mentioned before, and I thought it was a very impressive number. What are the points of data? How many would you get? Well, let's say you have three or four sensors within a device uh, taking data point readings once a minute, once every two minutes. After about a month's time, if you go to download that and go to print it, you're looking around 30,000 pieces of paper. Holy smokes, that's a whole lot. Okay, Simon, this is a rapid fire question before we get to our Q&A. And that is, um, what are your views on the testing that SGS does and how it can help with the issue of determining air quality? 
Oh, that's it's a very topical one at the moment. We're getting a, a lot of inquiries uh, about um, air purifiers, which is what we're talking about today primarily, really, isn't it? And who doesn't want to breathe clean air? Who doesn't want their family to breathe clean air? It's important. Hashtag team clean air. Remember, <laughs> hashtag team clean air. Let's make it trending. And you know what, what's what's also important is, is making sure that the, the, the filter uh, system or the purifier that you're trusting to provide that for you is doing what it's supposed to do. And it needs to be validated by an independent test house. And do you know who can do that for you? <laughs> so, so, so from our point of view, we, I, I get a little, little, little technical here. So when we're, when we're talking about, you know, when we, at, the, at the top of this conversation, PM1, PM2.5 and PM10, what does that really mean? It's a tiny, tiny particles. So what we do in our lab is we, we fill a room with, uh, with a known amount of pollen for example. Now, pollen is typically 10 microns, slightly larger. So that gives us a good broad range around the PM10 size. Then we do a test on that and see how good the purifier is at removing that. We then test for dust. Uh, it's a specific type of dust. I'll bore you with the details, but they're typically around about 2.5 microns in terms of size. So that covers up nicely across our PM2.5 range. And then we also, we also test for cigarette smoke because that gives us very, very, very small particles around about the, the PM1 size, but also right down towards 100 nanometers, which is around the size of a coronavirus particle. So we cover this whole range of, of, of particulate matter sizes, and we can, you know, quantify how well a, mach how well a machine performs in terms of uh, producing clean air, clean breathing air for people. So it's, um, yeah, it's important. It's topical, and, and, and we're all over it. Okay, so we've got a quick Q&A because we've only got a couple of minutes left. Simon, this first one's for you. Um, how long do filters last and how do we know when one has gone bad or needs changing? Uh, quick question, long answer, unfortunately, because it depends what? on the application, right? Okay. If you've got a filter that's supposed to remove odors and all of a sudden you start smelling things, it gives you an idea, right? But being serious, what, what most manufacturers will specify is a time, right? You have to change okay. it every 12 months or after so many hours of operating. If you think of it like the service on your car, you know, it depends how many miles you do. It depends how, how often you operate the machine. But it also depends on how heavy a load you're putting on it. So in, in industry, let's say, um, let's say it's a, an, an oil filter, um, or a, let's say an air filter in compressed air, because that's something I know, I know a lot about. Okay. They will typically monitor what they call pressure loss. And that is a, that all that is, is a, it's a way of measuring how blocked the filter is. And it'll have a limit. So, so once you start restricting the airflow or reducing the amount of pressure in the system because the filter's starting to get blocked, you need to change it. And that'll be monitored live, usually in, in most industrial systems. So like I said, it depends on the application. If it's at home, have a smell or change it out after so much time industrial you tend to quantify it and, and change it based on actual parameters that are measured so pay attention to the information that you're given look at the box where you it's just like your furnace right you have to change your furnace filter every so often Absolutely. Uh, i learned that one the hard way um <laughs> okay tim this question's for you in terms of monitoring how valuable has this technology become and in what kinds of scenarios and this is our final question. Well, it's become invaluable. I'll give you a couple of different scenarios um, okay. in post or getting towards post COVID area. I've had customers call me that have purchased multi-million dollar filtration systems for their schools, for their businesses, for their for whatever it is. Um, once the filtration systems are in, I, I would be getting phone calls and they're like, well, we're not really sure if this is working well or not. We don't know. Um, so in that, side, that scenario right there, we can come in and provide the data that backs that up or proves that it's really not doing much better than the one system before that. Mm -hmm. um, we've had um, other situations um, in uh, facilities where um, it's an outdoor application. Um, there's two, uh, two different businesses with a fence line separating them. And one business is pointing the finger at that person and the other business is pointing the finger at the other person. Um, we are able to actually add wind speed and direction anemometers to our technology as well. So not only can we put devices on the fence line, we can tell which direction the wind's blowing at particular times when alerts occur. And we have valid data that we can provide both sides of the fence what's happening at that particular time. Um, it's, it's limitless what we can do with this technology. It really is. Uh, but the key, again, is not having to be there at the right time. 
Um, the device itself will alert you, the consultant, or you, the business owner, when you have a problem. You know what? That is fantastic information. Gentlemen, this has been a fact-filled and fun half hour. I'd like to take a moment to thank both of you, Tim Quinn and Dr. Simon Harkis, for joining me today to talk about the changes to your new normal where you live and work. Thank you. Thank you. I know that a tremendous amount of information has been covered today, and we are glad you were here to be a part of it. Visit our website, sgs.com. Leave us comments in our chat. Thanks for watching SGN LinkedIn Live. I'm PJ Kwong. Bye for now.